is at the point where our car was at the security check as they were checking our car uh, when we had the first shot and it sounded like a very loud gunshot and in my mind and even with my friend we thought probably it's a robbery or something He told me, um, D, it is a terrorist attack. The next call that we got was, uh, we go identify his body at uh, Chiromo Machal. And actually he's been hit uh, like twice. My name is Ben Mulwa. And I, I am one person who is extremely passionate about uh, good governance. Mm -hmm. Besides that, I do, uh, I am a governance, a public sector governance consultant. Actually, that's what I have done for the last over uh, 15 years. Hey, good morning, Jan. Good morning, how are you? I'm all right, and yourself? I'm fine too. Uh, Thank you for sana. having us. Mm, karibu. Okay, Asante. Asante. Yes, talk to me. <laughs> Have you been? I'm all right. You're okay. Yes, you are one of the survivors of Westgate. Yes. Um, kindly, can you tell us what happened, what uh, unfolded that day? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was actually going for lunch with a friend of mine. Um, and as we were driving in, <coughs> uh, you know, on Mwanzi Road, we had, jo we had joined the road from Peponi Road on Mwanzi Road. And as we were approaching the mall, uh, we, there was no indication that there was anything likely to happen. And we drove well up to the far end of the Westgate Mall where there is the drive-in to the rooftop parking. Uh, they changed now, but that's where there used to be the drive-in to the rooftop parking. So it is at the point where our car was at the security check as they were checking our car uh, when we had the first shot. And it sounded like a very loud gunshot. And in my mind, and even with my friend, we thought probably it's a robbery or something. Mm -hmm. Then came the second one. Then came the third one. Then now uh, the frequency really increased. And all of a sudden you could hear people screaming. And we were not sure exactly now what was happening because from where we were, you couldn't see, uh, uh, the loc uh, you couldn't see what was happening on the road. Mm -hmm. And still, in our minds, we were convinced it is a robbery because, you know, the Westgate Mall, like today still, used to house very high-end shops. There used to be the Nakumat supermarket and many banks and all that. So we considered that maybe they are just robbers who are trying to scare away people. But suddenly we could hear the gunshots approaching because, you know, the Westgate Mall is very long along Mwanzi Road. Mm -hmm. We could hear the gunshots approaching where we were. And in our thinking, uh, particularly myself, I considered uh, uh, these guys were just trying to clear the traffic because, you know, it's lunchtime and it gets a bit busy. Mm -hmm. So probably they were just trying to clear the traffic to exit through where there, there used to be Nakumat UK and flee. So we stayed put actually in our cars. It was not until we saw the security guards who normally man that entrance um, uh, run away. Uh, uh, for, for, for their dear lives. That's when you realize probably this is worse than we had initially thought. Mm -hmm. um, one of my friends, uh, the, the friend I was with, actually ran all the way uh, to the rooftop of the mall. Uh, in my mind, because I thought it's just a, uh, these guys are planning a getaway, I just stepped out of the car and hid in a small flower bed just right next to the security check. Uh, we had a third person in the car and he ran to the basement. Um, so before I could settle down, that's when I saw uh, two gunmen mm -hmm. walking mm -hmm. with bullets strapped uh, around them uh, with a turban on their heads. And then that's when I realized this is worse than I am. But now there was honestly no time to think anything. Mm -hmm. um, all I remember is I tried to put myself in, you know, I was squatting where I was uh, uh, trying to hide. But when you walk through the gate now, I am not hiding anymore because there are flower shrubs that are about uh, one and a half feet tall. Mm -hmm. So when you are just uh, squatting in there, then you are not hiding. And I was against a wall. Uh, that's when this gunman walked in. I remember seeing one of them shooting in, uh, into the security cubicle. Unfortunately, there's a security guard who lost his life there. Then uh, the second gunman aimed the gun at us. There was a security guard who was just in front of me. We were separated by a flower shrub. 
and he was actually shot in the head and I saw him fall down and I remember seeing a lot of blood splatter it was at that stage um, I tried to push myself down to lie on the ground and all I remember is I saw the gunman also aim the gun at me uh, forever, I'm forever grateful to God because the gun, the, the bullet hit the wall that was right behind me and I was hit on the knee by a ricochet. Uh, had it been a direct shot, I don't think I would be able, I would have a leg today or I would be able to walk again. And it, it's at that stage now, I was lying down and I closed my eyes and everything was happening so fast. Um, I was, uh, I remember just uh, screaming out my, like, oh my God, what, what is all this? And I remained in that position for quite some time. Then I could, from the edge of my eye, while lying down there, I could see the gunman walking and shooting indiscriminately into cars. So there were two of them. One of them went into the basement. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one, you could hear the gunshots fading in towards uh, the rooftop mm -hmm. of the mall. So I think we stayed in that position for like 10 or so minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's when I heard uh, somebody calling out from the outside asking people to step out of the mall with their hands raised up. Uh, up to that point I didn't think I had been injured until uh, I saw a few people start walking out of their cars because now there were cars that were driving out uh, lined up all the way to the rooftop. Uh, that's when I saw a few people start walking out of their cars with their hands raised up. So I felt that probably some rescue has arrived. It's at that point when I tried to get up that I had a very sharp pain cut across my thigh. And I saw a lot of blood on my, on my leg, but I didn't think I had been injured. Mm -hmm. uh, so the only thing I was able to do is get back to the car, switch off the engine. In fact, I left even the windows rolled down. There was no time to fiddle with anything. Mm -hmm. And then I stepped out. And I, I forever uh, wish to be grateful to the social league of the Asian community. They were the first responders to arrive there. Uh, by the time I walked, I walked out of the mall, I was essentially limping. So one of them saw how injured I was and they rushed to pick me up. Uh, to date, he's remained a very good friend of mine, the person who rescued me. His name is uh, Nirav Shah. Mm -hmm. And he rushed me to the uh, MP Shah Hospital. Uh, with uh, blaring horns and all that, you know, it was not an ambulance. And within a few minutes, we were at the MP Shah Hospital, and it was amazing because by the time we got there, it's like the hospital was 103 percent uh, prepared for the, such an eventuality. And what was actually going through your mind mm -hmm. when you witnessed a bullet uh, passing through a watchman's head, and you are just next to that person actually unfortunately up to that point i was still convinced it's a robbery so i thought probably these guys have a bigger mission than we initially had thought uh, so i thought they were just trying to dis disable the security so when i saw them shooting into the security cubicle and then i saw them targeting also the security guard who was next to me i was convinced probably these guys are just trying to eliminate the security maybe to facilitate their getaway or whatever it was it didn't occur to me at all that uh, this was a terrorist attack. I was still convinced this was um, I was still convinced this was a robbery, and probably these guys were only targeting the security guards to maybe create a way to get out of the facility. Uh, so I remember one of the gunmen, as I explained, went to the basement, and the other one went to uh, the rooftop of the mall. And after we were called out, that's when we were, I, I was among the first people, in fact, at the list that was pinned at the MP Shah Hospital. I think I was either the third or the fourth person to be evacuated from them all. I consider myself extremely lucky because um, uh, the incident really uh, escalated into something very untidy for those who were holed up in the mall. Some of the people stayed there overnight until the following day. And it was at that point, I remember um, at the hospital, as I was explaining to you, mm -hmm. I was totally amazed by the preparedness of the facility. I am forever grateful to the MP Shah Hospital because uh, by the time I got there, um, now my leg was numb. I couldn't even walk. So they brought a wheelchair within a few seconds and I was wheeled to the emergency room. Uh, the pain was so bad. I remember getting an injection to deflate the pain and 
there was a nurse ready to clean up the wound and uh, within a few minutes I had already been wheeled to the theater to establish whether I had a fracture and all that. It was really amazing. Uh, the entire operation much later I learned was being coordinated by a lady called Dr. Hadika Shah and she worked more than 30 hours at the facility without taking a break because while I was there a lot of other people who had been injured now started arriving and mm -hmm. that's when I realized this was probably worse than I had initially thought. Mm -hmm. But still, in my mind, I was convinced it was a robbery. So at about 4 p.m. after I had been treated and uh, at least the pain, I had some relief on the pain, that's when I, I uh, walked to the reception of the hospital and on the news I could see on the screens, Westgate under siege. So in my mind I'm like, why are these guys still here? It is more than four hours, three mm -hmm. hours mm -hmm. uh, since the, um, the incident. Mm -hmm. What are they trying to steal from Westgate? Mm -hmm. um, then that, that's when I came face to face with this uh, uh, ugly reality that was out there. Uh, by that point, uh, a few bodies had started arriving at the hospital. The whole place was bloody. It was a mess. And that's when it hit me. That's yeah, actually, this is a terrorist attack. Uh, as I indicated to you, my situation was not very bad because at least I could uh, uh, move myself around. And now as more people continued arriving, mm -hmm. um, by around 6 p.m., it was so bad, uh, some of us had to create space uh, for the, the more injured who were continuing to arrive. So I spoke to the doctors and I was like, I'm okay, I think I can... I can go home, then come back for my review tomorrow. <laughs> That's when my brother came and picked me up, uh, took me home. And yeah, I remember from MP Shore. Uh, um, yes. At that time, you are coming back to your senses. Yes. Did you try to find out uh, the whereabouts of your, your colleagues that you are with? Luckily, I had uh, managed to escape with, um, with, with my two phones. And it is a very sad situation because the uh, friend of mine who ran to the rooftop. I, I told you, you remember there was a very uh, bad attack at the rooftop where s children died, including the former presenter the, with the Radio Africa group, mm -hmm. uh, Ruhila Adatia. Um, when the gunmen arrived and they threw grenades into the crowd, uh, my friend, is called Steve, actually jumped from the rooftop. rooftop all the way back into the Peponi Plaza because he was not alone. A lot of people jumped that. Luckily, and for some reason, he never suffered any broken limbs because, you know, it's like jumping from the third floor or the fourth floor all the way to the, to the, to the ground. And from there, he was part of the people who were rescued. Uh, we met um, about an hour or two later at the MP Shah Hospital. He came check, he was checked for injur injuries. He was also taken for the x-ray. Luckily, he survived. The other friend who ran to the basement, he was very lucky because when the, in, in final, the, when the rescue team eventually arrived, he was among the people who were rescued at about 6 p.m. the same day. But he didn't have any injuries. He didn't uh, suffer nothing. So they were the ones who were released to, to, to go home. <laughs> Did you sustain any kind of injury or a scar? Yes, I did, actually. As I mm -hmm. told you, uh, the bullet that was aimed at me hit the wall and I was hit on my knee by a ricochet. Mm -hmm. And if you allow me, actually, I can show you. I still have a scar on the side. Uh, as you can see, actually, this was the bullet injury. And one of the key things that um, I always uh, remember any time I look at this scar is I am still convinced uh, God saved my life for a purpose and for a reason. I don't think there is anything special about Ben Mulua uh, for him to survive that incident and for the young children and the many people who died in that incident to die. So I still believe I have a purpose and that keeps me going every day. What was your family reaction when they learned that you are among the people who are under siege in Westgate? Uh, I remember my mom was extremely traumatized because the first person I called, uh, I remember I was, in fact, I was to finish lunch at the Westgate and go for a meeting in town. So the first person I called was um, my, my younger brother. And I was extremely uh, brief because I remember calling him when I was in the car uh, being driven to the MP show. I just told him, 
uh, I have been shot and I'm being taken to the MP Shah Hospital and I disconnected. Um, I remember the other, the second person I remember calling was, um, he was then a journalist with the Standard Group. Uh, he's, he's called uh, Mwaniki Munuhe. Mm -hmm. And he's, I, I called Mwaniki and told him, uh, we have been attacked at the Westgate Mall and uh, we are being taken to the MP Shah Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, then I, I think I called one or two other people and the shock now went around and you see now the news has been broken on radio and tv and now everybody is wondering what's going on at the westgate mall mm -hmm. um it, it was very traumatizing especially for my my parents because my mom uh, took off uh, immediately from makweni to to come to nairobi uh, she arrived much later in the evening because you know the attack actually happened about it was exactly five minutes to one o'clock because I remember checking the clock, it was exactly five minutes to one o'clock when we were just driving past the pedestrian entrance into the driveway. And yeah, it was, it was uh, pretty traumatizing. Um, uh, you know, now everybody is worried about uh, the state of the injury. And then I also have a younger brother who does not live in the country uh, at the moment. He was the first one to arrive. He's, he, he played a huge role, really, in helping me get wheeled to the uh, to the uh, X-ray and moving around for the treatment, the bandaging, and all that. Uh, kindly give us your your process of uh, healing. How did your journey take through? For, it is very surprising, Jail, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um, uh, the Westgate incident uh, really never hit me bad. As I indicated to you, um, even when I was at the hospital, uh, it, it never really got to me. It is very, because much later when I was talking even to some uh, psychiatrists, uh, they were surprised at how I was able to uh, pick up uh, from the incident. Mm -hmm. I used to go for my review at the MP Shah Hospital and I used to make time to go visit other victims. And, and encourage them. I was working on crutches. And one of the most uh, memorable things is that even up to today, we still have uh, victims who have never recovered from that incident. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, the trauma was the issue of loud sounds. For a very long time, I could not stand the sound of a gun. Mm -hmm. And I could not stand a loud sound like a banging door or anything. But I used to sit and sometimes begin to wonder, especially when the story comes back on news or you chance upon a video or something, and you start asking yourself, like this particular fella who aimed his gun at me, this is somebody I don't know. He doesn't know me. Mm -hmm. I don't owe him anything. Uh, why would he just want to wake up in the morning, pick a gun and come and kill me? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a question I keep asking myself. When I think about the young children who were killed mm -hmm. in that incident, mm -hmm. I keep wondering, why would somebody wake up in the morning, um, pick a grenade and pick guns just to go kill children? You know, for me, that has never made sense. And at, at least, as I told you, I was not really traumatized. Uh, by the Westgate incident, mm -hmm. but the one incident that really hit me hard was the Garissa uh, University attack. I was paralyzed for almost a week because you see now I was outside looking in and that was ugly, that was nasty. And when the picture started going of those kids on the lying on the floor, uh, with their heads shot. You know, now it took me right back to where we were at Westgate. And this was the ugliest thing I think I have ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. A whole 147 kids killed for nothing. Uh, that was, yeah. F I think that's when now, you know, uh, when I was talking to psych uh, psychiatrists, I was saying that there are those incidences that will trigger really the trauma that you may have been harboring. Mm -hmm. Because even during the Westgate incident, I, I walked on. I was like, yeah, we, life moved on. And I was grateful to God that um, uh, my life had been saved. And even the following week, I used to go to, no, uh, it, it took about two weeks before Mwanzi Road was reopened. Mm -hmm. And I continued with my shopping actually at the Nakumat UK before Westgate was uh, reopened. Mm -hmm. When Westgate was reopened by the former governor, Kidero, mm -hmm. that was, I think, in 2016. Mm -hmm. I was among the first people there. And it never shop. affected no, you? No, it never affected me. I, as I told you, I still go to Westgate 
because um, it's one of the best malls we have in this country, mm -hmm. and it's one of my favorite malls. Uh, but the Garissa incident really hit me real hard. Um, so by then we had formed um, a support group. Um, uh, we had an initiative that we had support. Uh, we had uh, started off. I remember working very closely currently with the with the Nyeri Town MP. Is my friend uh, Gunjiri Wambugo. We started what we c we used to call the Terror Victims um, uh, Support Initiative (TVSI), and at least we could uh, make arrangements to visit other victims of terrorism, and particularly after after the Garissa University attack. Once you survive an incident like that, your life changes forever. Um, sometimes I actually, uh, you'll find myself uh, quarreling even with the security guards either at public institutions, especially when I, uh, when I detect lethargy. Mm -hmm. Because we have this habit of people just um, putting these metal scanners and just looking at you and... Um, I, I don't think this should be a one-off thing. Like any time, any time, uh, 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 like a terrorist attack happens, you suddenly realize everybody becomes very serious and very, um, very thorough with scrutiny and all that. Then after a week, we forget until maybe something else happens. So I think this should be a full-time thing, really, because um, as w o over time you have seen the face of terrorism. It is not very scrawny, very rough guys. Who you have seen many people, especially the young people that have been recruited into um, extremism uh, lately. Uh, they, they could be any person. So um, we have a duty, and personally, I, only, I always make sure that wherever I am, at least the, even those who are charged with the security of that facility are doing enough. Uh, you can't entirely prevent everything, but at least there needs to be that alertness at all times. And yeah, it, it, this incident really changed my life. Um, I never take my security for granted, but most importantly, I never take... Um, my life for granted. Uh, up to this incident, we still have multiple agencies with disjointed efforts doing different things on an incident like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, particularly like the Westgate incident, I believe, um, if uh, from what I gathered much later, there was a presidential escort team that uh, happened to have been or to have been on Peponi Road immediately after the incident, or it was just in the vicinity of that area uh, that uh, responded to the incident. And there were the initial, um, the initial re first responders who included the police officer who was shot in his belly, and currently now Senator Haji, uh, the young man Abdul, uh, he was among the first people to arrive there, the mm -hmm. brother to DPP Haji. And the Asian League also did an amazing job. And it was not until the KDF was called in that the whole thing was messed up, huge. Uh, it was extremely unfortunate that now it was so disjointed that even the wreck squad had to lose a police officer uh, in the confusion because there was no coordination in terms of the response. And yeah, that was a bit unfortunate. Then again came the incident of uh, Garissa where it took a whole eight hours to ferry uh, terrorism uh, experts from Nairobi to Garissa. These kids uh, started being butchered at 5 a.m. in the morning. Then uh, the wreck squad or whichever unit we have uh, arrives at Garissa at 5 p.m. I think that is the most ridiculous thing that I have ever witnessed mm -hmm. in my entire life. And having been a victim, and I look at the turnaround time that the uh, social league of the uh, Asian community responded. If somebody took eight hours to come to rescue us at Westgate, probably the casualties would have been in excess of 200 or 300. So that was really disastrous, especially the response to the Garissa incident. But over time, I think the government has invested better in intelligence mm -hmm. because the, the idea is really to prevent these kinds of occurrences. Uh, we cannot just be waiting for them to happen. Then we have 
the GSU responding, we have the regular police, we have also the AP who are in the different, under different command, we have the military uh, who also have a, counter who have a terrorism uh, response unit within themselves. Uh, we have the National Intelligence Service also trying to do their thing. Um, I, I think we, 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 would better, we would be better off really um, investing more in intelligence gathering and uh, prevention than waiting for these incidences to happen because even losing one life in such an incident is one life too many especially uh, to people who have nothing to lose people are on a, it, I, I consider it's a sick mission and i believe uh, we have a duty uh, as citizens uh, not only to continue um, playing our active role in ensuring that we are safe and we are secure um, but also uh, uh, working closely with our security agencies in the event we come across anything that is unbecoming. Um, and I'll tell you some of the, uh, so some of the precautions that I normally take. Um, when you call me and then uh, your colleague called me, mm -hmm. I had to call back and to find out whether you guys are genuinely work for, for KTN. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things that are standard for me mm -hmm. uh, because I don't take anything for chances or for granted anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody could be, uh, could, could be anything. So I believe we have a responsibility as citizens, especially in the incidences where you, you can see something suspicious. We have a duty um, to, uh, to either relay that information to institutions that uh, can take them up or at least uh, uh, ensure our personal safety and security at the most level that we can. So my name is Diana, I'm a mother. <laughs> and I work in the uh, hair and beauty industry, which I've been doing like for, I think now we're getting to 10 years <laughs> or 11. 2019 September yeah. is so memorable to you. You are one of the survivors of uh, Ducet. Kindly can you take us through that what unfolded that day? We just started our day as usual. It was a normal Tuesday. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, normally on Tuesdays are really slow days uh, for salons. And um, I can remember on this particular day, the salon was not very busy. So here walked in three guys. And um, they were carrying like this really big bag, black, uh, big black bag on them. And um, we welcomed them in, just like normal clients. And um, we sat them down. We sorted them, we actually did their haircuts. We did color on them. And um, after that, we cleared them. But one thing we noticed is uh, they were very, very noisy. And they were on phone throughout. They were calling, calling each other, but you know, when clients come to the salon, we just like make them just be free to do anything they want. But now on this, this one, they were too noisy and the calls were so many. And we didn't even bother. We sorted them out. After that, they left. But before they left, one of them actually asked me where the Ducey Hotel is. So where we were, where the salon was, we were directly opposite uh, Ducet. So I just directed them to where the Ducet Hotel is, was, and uh, yeah. How did you come to learn that you were under attack? Around uh, three, around three, yeah, is when we actually I was seated outside, then I decided to go back to the salon to get some water. So as, as I was getting out to go out to drink the water mm -hmm. is when I, he I had a loud bang. So when I heard the bang, I was like, it was like a gas explosion because our salon is opposite a, a restaurant, Secret Garden. So we thought either it was a gas explosion from there or something. Then a second explosion, then we were like, the second explosion now, all our dryers, our hair dryers were blowing up, the glasses were blowing up, so we were like, so I was the first one to get out of the salon to find out what was going on. So um, I get out and that's when I find people running. 
smoke all over. And uh, what I won't forget is when I stepped out, I just saw body parts outside our door. And the staff were coming out to go see what was going on. So I told them, everybody go back. Let's go back, because already gunshots were being heard all over. There was a lot of chaos around the place. So that's when we ran back inside, all of us. And uh, though some, some of my staff were outside, and uh, yeah, we went into our beauty rooms, locked ourselves there, mm -hmm. and now waited to hear what, <laughs> what was now going to happen. It had not hit me that this was a terrorist attack or anything. I think, guess I was just confused or something. So we went, we, are, we, I, I tried as, uh, we tried calling people, calling people, trying to find out what's going on. So I called a friend of mine and I was like, um, Silas, please find out for me what's going on at 14 Riverside because he knows some police guys who come. So he calls the guys, the guys tell him that it's a robbery. I told, Sil I told Silas, no, it's not a robbery. We've seen body parts, people are running, gunshots everywhere. I don't think it's a, a, I don't think it's a <coughs> robbery. He called me back and when he called me back, he told me, um, D, it is a terrorist attack. And I can remember that, I can, every time I tell that story, I always remember his tone when he said it's a terrorist attack. So I told my staff it's a terrorist attack. At that moment, what was running through your mind? At that moment, everything, everything was now, in fact, when we confirmed it's a terrorist attack, I was just thinking of my kids, I'm thinking of my parents, my brothers, my, I'm, I'm like, today is the day we die. Because now if it's a terrorist attack and our salon was at the gate, definitely if these guys are coming in, we'll be the first target. How long did it take before you got rescued? After an hour is when the Israeli guys came in. And when the Israeli guys came in, we didn't know they were, they were Israelis because they were speaking in this Hebrew, whatever language. So to us, we thought it's Somali or something and the way they were dressed because we could see them under the door we could see their, their dressing so they were in jeans and then they had boots, they had masks they had guns all over and bullets so where we were see, where we were in our mind we were like these guys are the terrorists who are coming mm -hmm. so they walked in and they started shooting all over. I think, I guess they wanted to check whether there were guys inside. But as guys, we don't know they are, uh, they, are, they are police guys. So they started shooting the windows, the, the mirrors, shooting and speaking in that language. So immediately we had that. That's when we knew it is over. For us, we knew we are dead. This is it to Misha. So after that, after like 10 minutes of shooting inside the salon is when they started saying that they are the police. So we are like, I, we cannot get out. Uh, then one, there was a lady who came out called Priska. She was like, let me go. Come on, the police, the police. If we die, we die. So she came out. When she came out is when they confirmed they are the police. So they called us and told us they are the police. And then that's how they cleared us out. What was your, the reaction of your family when they first learned that you are among amongst the people who are under siege? Actually, the first person I called was my mom. I called her and I told her um, we are under attack at 14 Riverside and it is, a, it is a terrorist attack according to what we are being told. And her reaction was just, <laughs> there's no way my daughter can be there, there's no way you can die. There's, it was just so dramatic, but she's the first person I called. Mm -hmm. Can you take us through your journey of recovery? How has it been? Um, it's been slow, but I can say right now, at least I'm in a better space. Mm -hmm. Before, it was not easy. Like right now, I can't go, I can't, I don't like loud noises, I don't like enclosed places, I can be somewhere and uh, in, 
anytime I walk in into a mall, anytime I walk in into a building, the first thing I check is the exit points. I'm like, should anything happen here? Where are the exit points? So it, it just gave me some kind of fear. Yeah, but I can say from then to now, it's a little bit better, but I still have that phobia mm -hmm. of closed spaces. How did the attack change your life? For counselling, mm -hmm. I remember we went twice. There's somewhere we had been referred to go to, mm -hmm. but for me, I just felt like counselling was not working for me, because after the counselling, when you leave, at the end of the day, you're going back to your house, and you're going to be alone. No one is going to be there. I think it was just more of friends, talking, making sure that you are never alone, you are with family, you are with friends, you are talking to people, yani there is no single point you are by yourself. So for me it, it worked, mm -hmm. just being around people. For you as a survivor, what would you expect to be, to be assisted on? I would really like, I don't know whether it's the people who we were given for counselling, who, who I didn't find, like, working for me but I would I, I wish they would put some like good counseling centers that when these people like people who have gone through this who can like go and just feel like and you're like we have people who are there to hear us people who will help us because I just felt I went there once twice and I was not I don't know probably I don't know what I was looking for <laughs> I don't know because I've never been to therapy yeah I just feel something needs to be done. Thanks so much for your time. And it's so motivating to see you standing strong and continue with your work. Mm -hmm. We so appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. As a victim of terror, how did it change your perception about terrorism? Um, we saw breaking news. Uh, uh, the uh, Ducit has been attacked. I remember telling my friends, because there are these women who are really crying on, on, on the screen, you know, they have lost some, they have lost their people. And then I told my colleague, you can imagine what is going through the mind of that woman, you know. She is wondering why out of 50 million people, only my son, only my child has, was so unfortunate to be involved in uh, the Ducit attack. Uh, before actually I had I even finished, you know, with that sentence, my mother called me. And she tells me that, uh, do you know that uh, Dedrix is, uh, uh, rather works at Ducit? And I was like, yeah, actually, at, there was at some point when I dropped him actually to work, then before I come here, I had to drop him first. That is when I called my cousin Dedrix, and we were very close uh, uh, friends, other than just being cousins. Um, the previous weekend, we were organizing the burial of our uncle. Actually, he had not even been buried. When I called Dedrix, he did not pick his phone. So then, now we started uh, looking for him. Can we really find him? The next call that we got was, uh, we go identify his body at uh, Chiromo Mochari. And actually, he's been hit uh, like twice. I, at the forehead, and uh, that is when I realized that uh, terrorism, it, it remains you know, a dictionary word until when it hits at, the, at your doorstep. That is when you realize how serious it is. Now, it's changed completely my perspective in terms of now fighting it just for the sake of, you know, terrorism. But now, I wouldn't like any other family, any other person to feel uh, the way we felt as a family. What kind of action did you take and how beneficial has it been to, especially to the youth? Okay. So for the youth, we decided to involve them. And for, it's the first thing that... Uh, that is really affecting the youth is, is you know, lack of uh, uh, employment, you know. And then they have a lot of time to their hands. So they can easily, I, we, we decided to take a trip to Majengo just to walk around and see how uh, it was being, uh, you know, how things are happening there. Majengo is one place that is um, full of youth, youth that are jobless. You know, you just go there, they're seated. And there is no wonder it is one of the places that has been hit hard with radicalization and extremism. So when they do not have anything to do then, that means they become very susceptible to uh, terrorism, to recruiters. Mm -hmm. So we decided to come up with, uh, to make sure that we engage them. And then we, uh, in, in terms of, you know, using their talents, giving them activities to do. And we have seen a lot of, um, a lot of results. Lengo Gaidi started like, uh, we're now on the fifth edition. And we have engaged the youth. 
when they win, you know, it's a competition. They create small videos and then they enter into the competition, then we award them. When we started, um, the, the winner, the overall winner was getting 500,000. That money, they use it now to you know, open like studios, uh, they buy cameras, and then they expand on their music, you know, poetry, filming, and they have, it has really been beneficial. And then other than that, we engage them all the time. Uh, we have walks, you know, we have bonanzas, we do them mostly in Eastlands, you know, uh, within Nairobi. So it has really been beneficial in terms of keeping them busy and, uh, you know, focusing uh, on education other than uh, the warped and skewed, um, you know, uh, terminologies that are and ideology that have been used by recruiters to take uh, them to Somalia, Yemen, Syria, and all into these uh, radicalization groups. Mm -hmm. yeah.